Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be starting into the very last section of our class, which is section 10.4 from your textbook, which is where we will be discussing how to do the sort of calculus operations that we've talked about in the past for rectangular coordinates and for parametric curves, but with polar coordinates. So in other words, this section 10.4 is going to be an investigation into the calculus of polar curves. So we're going to start off with the sort of most straightforward and basic thing that we'd want to sort of understand when working with polar uh, curves, which is how to determine the standard derivative dy dx when working with these polar curves. Now notation is really, really important here. You'll notice that the derivative we're trying to understand is dy dx, meaning we want to understand how the y or the vertical component is changing as we move in the horizontal component. This is not in talking about the derivative with respect to like theta or to r, the variables that we use in polar coordinates. So again, that's why we're sort of saying we want to understand the standard derivative, the derivative, derivative we spent so much time studying back in like Calc 1, or the derivative that we use to understand the slope of the tangent line, the standard derivative, but we want to be able to do it when working in polar coordinates. So let's explore how we can do this. So to do this, we're going to recall two sort of uh, important things that we got back in 10.3 when we talked about conversions. So recall the following conversions, right? Uh, we said x was r cosine theta and y was r sine theta. And these were the conversions that allowed us to start with something in polar coordinates and move to something in rectangular coordinates. We said that if you knew the theta and the r, you could plug it into these expressions and get the x and y coordinates of that same point. So now what we're going to do, I mean, this is useful because it's helping us understand things about y and x, which ultimately we're going to need to know for dy dx. Now the other thing we're going to bring in is what we did back when we discussed parametric curves. So we're going to sort of consider x and y as parametric functions of theta. So we're going to sort of imagine x and y as parametric functions of theta. Why do we do that? Well, then we can say that dy dx, back from what we did in section 10.2, where we studied the calculus of parametric curves, we said that the derivative of y with respect to x could be done as dy dt over dx dt. But here we're not using t as our parameter, we're using theta. So in other words, we could say dy dx is dy d theta over dx d theta. So if we can think about how y changes with respect to theta and how x changes with respect to theta, then that ratio will give us how y changes with respect to x. So how do we determine these? Well, we can think about differentiating these conversions with respect to theta. The only difficulty, though, is that there's also r in here. Now remember, when we've looked at our examples of graphing in polar coordinates, we always have r as a function of theta. So we're thinking about this r as also a function of theta. So when we differentiate these, we will need to go ahead and use a uh, product rule. So if we go ahead and differentiate dy d theta, we'd first differentiate the r, so we'd get something like dr d theta times sine theta. Then we would leave the r alone and differentiate the sine theta, which is cosine theta. So we get r cosine theta. So that would be our numerator. And then in the denominator, we do the same thing. Use product rule, treating r as a function of theta. So we differentiate that with respect to theta, dr d theta cosine theta. And then we would add to that. If we differentiate now, leaving the r alone, differentiating cosine theta, well, differentiating cosine theta gives us a negative sine theta, so we'll have to go back and change that to a minus there. So we'll get minus r sine theta. So this gives us an expression where everything is in terms of theta, because remember this r can be thought about as a function of theta as well. So we get a function entirely in terms of theta that tells us the standard derivative, which is exactly what we wanted. So if you want to calculate like the slope of the tangent line to a polar curve, and you have that polar curve as r as a function of theta, you can simply use this expression to determine the derivative at any value of theta for dy dx. Okay, let's go ahead and quickly summarize this and then take a look at some examples. So uh, again, as a summary, we're going to suppose that we have a polar curve where we're thinking about r as a function of theta. So remember, that's things like r equals 
you know, two sine theta or r equals four plus three cosine theta or r equals two cosine four theta, whatever, right? All of those are treating r as a function of theta. Then we can calculate the standard derivative dy dx by doing dr d theta sine theta plus r cosine theta divided by dr d theta cosine theta minus r sine theta, exactly what we just derived on the previous page. So this is a very important expression. It's the polar equivalent to doing derivatives in parametric coordinates, which said that dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. This does it for polar coordinates. Okay, let's go ahead then and use this right away in an example. If you think back uh, into section 10.3, we talked about how uh, there's sort of a very special uh, situation of the limoson, which are those a plus b sine theta or a plus b cosine theta, when the a and b have the same magnitude. So we're going to take a look at that example, and we're going to make use of this derivative to confirm something that we claimed in 10.3. So let's go ahead and take a look. So for this example, we're going to use the polar curve r equals 4 minus 4 sine theta. Right away, we should remember that this is a limoson. That's the sort of name for this. And since 4 and negative 4 have the same absolute value, uh, this should have a sharp, quote unquote, corner. And since it is based around sine, it should be sort of vertically symmetric. So we expect that there's some sort of vertical symmetry there. Actually, back in 10.3, we said that in the case where this A and B have the same magnitude, we could actually uh, call it not just a limosome, but actually a cardioid, because that sharp corner is going to give it sort of a harp-like shape. But we're actually going to see, once we get the derivative, that the sharp corner really is sharp. So what are we going to do with this? Well, we're going to determine an expression for dy dx. We're going to determine the slope of the tangent line at a couple different angles, pi over 2 and 5 pi over 4. And then we're going to sketch a graph of this using a uh, table of values as well as our knowledge that it's a limachon and it's vertically symmetric already. And then we'll also indicate the tangent lines that we found in B on our graph. So we'll probably go ahead and we'll sort of save this space for a table of values so that we can use this nice uh, graph there. So for actually doing this stuff, we'll give ourselves a, uh, another page real quick. So uh, remember for this, we have r equals 4 minus 4 sine theta. So let's go ahead and try to get an expression for dy dx. So according to, uh, to our derivation we just did, we, this should be dr d theta sine theta plus r cosine theta divided by dr d theta cosine theta minus r sine theta. All right, since we have r equals 4 minus 4 sine theta, it should be pretty easy to go ahead and get dr d theta. dr d theta just means differentiate this with respect to theta. So of course, this will drop out. Derivative of sine is cosine, so it looks like we're going to get negative 4 cosine theta. So we can plug all this stuff in, dy dx. Instead of dr d theta, we'll put negative 4 cosine theta. So negative 4 cosine theta sine theta. Plus, instead of r, we can replace it with 4 minus 4 sine theta. So 4 minus 4 sine theta cosine theta. And then divided by, down here, dr d theta. That's minus 4 cosine theta. So minus 4 cosine theta. Okay, just rewrite that real quick. Okay, and then we'd have cosine theta, and then minus our r, which is 4 minus 4 sine theta, so 4 minus 4 sine theta times sine of theta. So you'll notice that this is an expression entirely based on theta. Theta is the only variable there that if we plug a theta value into, we get the slope of the standard tangent line, how y changes with respect to x. Could we simplify this? Uh, for sure, we could play around and see what sort of simplifications we come up with. But uh, a lot of the times, these don't simplify that much, or they're still pretty nasty even after simplification. So we'll just go ahead and leave it like this. Uh, if we want to go ahead and get dy dx at a couple values, let's go ahead and do that. I think we wanted to do dy dx at theta equals pi over 2 and theta equals 5 pi over 4. So just to make, keep track, we'll put a little evaluation bar, and we'll say we're doing this at theta equals pi over 2. So that means we're going to plug in pi over 2 into all of these things. Keep in mind that when theta equals pi over 2, the cosine terms are going to be 0. So this first one is going to be 0. 
plus. Over here, if we do theta equals pi over 2 into this guy, well, 4 minus 4 sine theta is also going to be 0. So it looks like we get 0 plus 0. Uh, down here, this will be 0, and this guy will be 0. Hmm. So we get 0 plus 0 over 0 plus 0. So this thing looks like we're going to get something like a 0 over 0 sort of situation. So this tells us, uh, even though we don't know exactly sure what this value is going to be, right, that certainly we're undefined here. So what does that tell us when we get a slope that is undefined? Well, since we got a slope that's undefined, that tells us that we have a vertical tangent at theta equals pi over 2. Okay, perfect. So we now know that we have a vertical tangent at theta equals pi over 2. Let's go ahead and also check it at 5 pi over 4. So we can do dy dx, evaluate it at theta equals uh, 5 pi over 4. So we can plug that in and see what we get there. Uh, so if we plug in 5 pi over 4, if you think about where 5 pi over 4 is located, it's this angle down here. This is where both cosine and sine are going to be negative root 2 over 2. So plugging that in, uh, looks like we should get 2 root 2 uh, times negative root 2 over 2 plus 4 plus 2 root 2 times negative root 2 over 2 up top. And then in the denominator, it looks like we should get 2 root 2, negative root 2 over 2, uh, minus 4 plus 2 root 2, times negative root 2 over 2. All right, we can simplify this guy a little bit, because all these things are just numbers here. So we can cancel those out, and root 2 times negative root 2 sounds like negative 2. So this is going to be negative 2 plus... And then over here, uh, I guess everything's going to be negative. So, that. Uh, so it looks like we get minus 2 root 2. And then when we multiply this, we'll cancel that, and then a minus 2. So there we go. And then down in the denominator here, well, uh, we'll cancel out those 2s, root 2 and negative root 2. That sounds like minus 2. And then minus, uh, everything's going to turn into a plus here and divide that two, so we get two root two, and then we look like we get plus uh, two. So after simplifying all that, looks like we get minus four, minus two root two, over uh, two root two, which I guess if we simplify a little bit more, we can cancel a two out of everything, get minus two minus root two, over root 2, and I guess we could divide the root 2 in as well and get minus root 2 minus 1. So if you think about that, root 2 is roughly about 1.4. Uh, so this is going to be about a negative 2.4 slope. So when we look at theta equals 5 pi over 4, we're expecting sort of a downward facing slope that has a slope of about negative 2.4, so a pretty steep negative slope at that theta equals 5 pi over 4. Okay, so this was making use of the derivative expression. We found out that we are going to have an undefined slope uh, a v or a vertical tangent at theta equals pi over 2, and we're going to have a negative slope of about negative 2.4 at theta equals 5.5 5 pi over 4. Let's go ahead and sketch this and actually look at what we've sort of determined here. So we'll go back over here and we'll make use of this polar paper. Uh, we'll go ahead and make a little table of values. So we'll have our theta. And we'll have our r equals 4 minus 4 sine theta. Now, in the, B, in the first video, 10.3, uh, we, whenever we were graphing, we sort of went really carefully, and we made sure to go by about an eighth of the period so that we could get a lot of the values. Considering that we know that this is a limason, and we know that it's vertically symmetric, and we've talked about these families, we can probably go a little bit faster. Instead of going by like an eighth of the period, you might get away with going by like a fourth of the period. So in other words, since the period here is 2 pi, divide that by 4, we might be able to get away with just going by pi over 2. If we don't feel like that's enough values, then we can always sort of, uh, you know, add in more later. But it's if you want to try to speed it up a little bit, you certainly can, since we already sort of know what this is supposed to look like. So I'll do 0, uh, pi over 2, pi. I will go ahead and do 5 pi over 4, just for fun, because we did find the tangent at that place then 3 pi over 2, and then 2 pi. And we'll see if that's enough to sort of draw this in.
So uh, also keep in mind that here we're expecting a vertical, uh, sorry, not at zero, at pi over two, we're expecting a vertical sort of tangent here. And then at five pi over four, we're expecting some sort of downward facing, pretty steep. Notice it's not horizontal or vertical, so I, I don't normally draw these in, but since we did go ahead and calculate it, let's just put a little downward sort of facing slope because we know that that's what we expect there. All right, let's plug in some values here. We're gonna get four at pi over two, looks like we're gonna get zero, uh, then four at five pi over four, uh, that sign is going to be negative root two over two. Uh, if we do four plus four times root two over two, that sounds like four plus two root two. Uh, root two is roughly about 1.4, so that sounds like about 2.8. Uh, so we get four plus two root two, which is roughly about 6.8, if you want to check. At three pi over two, this will be negative one. So negative four times negative one is gonna be positive four, and this is gonna be an eight, and then we'll be at four here. So let's go ahead and plot those. Uh, angle zero, radius four, one, two, three, four. So we'll be right there. That's our first point. Then at pi over two, we're at the origin. Okay. So remember, we are gonna to have to sort of move is yeah, so we get smaller and smaller radii, and then we're gonna have to make it in here. And then of course we know that it's supposed to go vertical there. So you can sort of see how you would do that. And keep that thing sort of like that. Okay, and notice I know that it makes it to that origin before that angle of pi over two. So it doesn't look anything like that. It has to make it in before that pi over two. So there we go. Then at pi, we're out at four. So one, two, three, four, we're out here. Once again, we sort of want uh, that sort of sharp piece there. And there we go. So you can see why this is gonna get that cardioid sort of shape. You can probably guess what the remainder is going to look like. Uh, this is sort of that top portion. So we're expecting some sort of bottom portion like that. And again, symmetric vertically because it was based on sine. Let's see, we get five pi over four because we had that one as an extra sort of point. Uh, five pi over four looks to be right here. And we got a radius of about 6.8. So if we follow that out, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and 0.8. So it's maybe somewhere right about there. Okay. And then at three pi over two, which is facing down this way, we're at eight. So we're down here. And then at two pi, uh, which is facing back this way, we're back to here. So we can see that this thing's going to swing out, hit this, Come in like that. Notice that as I'm drawing this portion here, I'm always inside my big radius eight circle because I know that the largest this can be is eight because the largest sign can be is negative one to one. So the biggest this radius can be is eight there. And then since it's symmetric, we can have this thing sort of swing in. Uh, looks like I should have it be a little smoother. Yeah, there we go. Now, like I said, even if your drawing is not perfect, uh, these two halves, this stuff over here and this stuff over here should be symmetric here. Uh, can we see these here? Well, uh, if we zoom in, if we put this guy in sort of red here, that's what happened right there, where these two portions, this guy sort of came in like this, and then this piece went like that. That's why we have a vertical tangent there. And of course, this guy here, if we circle this, well, if we find five pi over four, that was this point right here. And yep, that's what we sort of expected. Right? It's supposed to be sort of a downward facing slope. And notice that that's the slope of the tangent line, that line that approximates the slope right at that point. So there we go. So if you were actually imagining sort of tracing this thing out and you were right at this point and you were advancing in X, so you were sort of moving this way, which means you're sort of swinging out that way there. Well, you would be headed down in terms of Y, which is why back over here, we got a sort of negative slope value there.
So there we go. Now we've done another sort of quick example of graphing in polar coordinates, but we also know how to examine the sort of tangent lines at different values, the traditional dy dx, even though we were still in polar coordinates. Also notice that this does confirm that in this situation where this four, uh, where this a and b had the same magnitude, we really do get a sharp corner there. If this had been like four plus three sine theta, then it would actually have a little spot where it sort of goes flat, more like that. So it would actually go sort of horizontal there. So just keep in mind when these values are the same, it should be a sharp sort of piece there. Okay, so now we know how to do derivatives in polar coordinates. So let's change our sort of view to a different sort of calculus based thing that we've wanted to understand about functions, but to do this in polar coordinates. So we're going to talk about areas. So areas for polar curves. Now, just like in the other ones, we're going to do a quick visualization and an exploration and then sort of summarize this. But we do need to make one sort of note because working with areas in polar coordinates is a bit different than some of the other areas. When working with areas for polar curves, we have to be very sort of careful here. Since we're going to be working d theta, right, eventually our variable of integration is going to be theta, we are not going to be thinking about the area beneath the curve, right? When you integrate dx, you're sort of moving in x, so you're, you're sort of moving under your curve, and you're measuring the area beneath your curve and above the x-axis. But we're going to be working d theta, so the angle is going to be changing. And if you think about what happens as an angle changes, if this is one angle and you move to here, what you're really doing is you're sort of sweeping from here to here. So you're sort of starting from this angle here and you're moving to this angle there. That means the area isn't going to be the stuff underneath. Instead, it's going to be the area swept out. In other words, the area of the sort of wedge or slice that's determined by the first angle and the second angle as we follow your curve. So in other words, when we're thinking about areas for polar curves, we're going to be thinking about the area of a wedge or slice that is between two angles, alpha and beta. So let's go ahead and see how we can actually measure that area. So let's give ourselves sort of a very basic sort of curve here. So I'm going to start by looking at a couple angles. So maybe this is theta equals alpha, and this is theta equals beta. And then we have some curve that maybe goes something like that. So this curve starts at this angle, and then we move along, getting different radii at each moment. Okay, and there we go. And we want to measure the area of that sort of slice. So our goal is not to determine this stuff. We're not going to be looking at the area beneath the curve and above the x-axis. Instead, we're going to be looking at the area of that wedge between those two angles. So we're really going to be trying to measure this. Okay, so how do we actually measure this? Well, what we do is we sort of do our standard sort of approach. We're going to take a very sort of small slice uh, you know what, and let's, uh, let's go ahead and just redraw a slightly larger picture now that we sort of know what we're talking about here. So, how to measure this area. Well, let's give ourselves a slightly sort of larger picture here. Just so we have a bit more room. Okay. Okay. And let's imagine we give ourselves a small sort of slice here. And we're going to say that the sort of amount of angle from here to here, right, the amount you have to rotate, is going to be delta theta. Now, this curve over here, that black curve, is some radius that is based on whatever the value of the angle is. In other words, the radius is determined by a function of theta, just like all the sort of examples we've done. That means that the radius here is going to be different than the radius here, because this is going to be some theta value, and this is going to be a different theta value. So the radius is changing. But since we're going to make this delta theta really small, let's imagine that this doesn't really change. So what we're going to do is if we cut out this piece, we can say it's approximately sort of a circular slice. In other words, we can say that it sort of comes out here, 
Let's draw my two angles first. So come. And we're going to assume, we're going to say that this is a constant radius. In other words, the distance along here is the same as the distance here is the same as the distance in the middle. Now, of course, that's not actually true because our radius is changing as theta changes, but that's why we're saying approximately. So we can say that this is a circular wedge. So how do we get the area of a circular wedge? Well, area of circular wedge. Well, we know the area of a circle. It's pi r squared, right? That's how you calculate the area of a circle. And of course, this is only one little piece of a circle. So if this is delta theta, right, the change in the angle here, then what we would say is if delta theta, this is sort of like a ratio. This is only a piece of the circle. How much angle gives us a full circle? Well, a full circle is defined by two theta radians. This is only delta, uh, delta, sorry, two pi radians. This is only delta theta. So that tells us that the area of the circular wedge is delta theta divided by two pi. It, this measures how much of a full circle this little wedge piece is. And then of course, this measures the area of the overall circle. So the area of the circular wedge is delta theta over 2 pi, pi r squared. So let's go ahead and take that onto sort of the next page here. So we have this area of circular wedge is going to be equal to that delta theta over 2 pi, which measures how big of a wedge it is compared to the whole circle, and then pi r squared, which is the area of the circle. Doing a little simplification, we can cancel that. We can stick that at the end, and we get that this is one half, one half r squared delta theta. Well, then what we can say is that the overall area, the actual area we wanted to measure, which I believe I actually put in blue, that means our area is approximately the sum of all these wedges. So it's approximately the sum of this one half r squared delta theta. But then of course, we know that we can make this into an equality by taking the area as the limit as that delta theta gets very close to zero of the sum of one half r squared delta theta. Well, if then this should remind you of a Riemann sum. So if we think that this is started from theta equals alpha and it ends at theta equals beta, then we can think about this area as equal to the definite integral from alpha to beta, one half r squared d theta. And of course, when we actually go to do this, we'll have to treat r as f of theta. So you'll have to replace r with ever the, which, whatever the function of theta that represents r is in this expression. So this gives us a way of calculating an area when integrating with respect to this variable theta, the angle variable. The key thing here is the derivation is actually just identical to all the other derivations we did. We did, took an approximating piece, summed up the approximating pieces, treated it as a limit of those approximating pieces, and then that turns into a definite integral. But the really crucial thing is actually back in this diagram. You have to make sure you understand that when working with areas in polar coordinates, you are not thinking about the traditional area beneath the curve and above the x-axis. Instead, you're always thinking about the area trapped between two angles, sort of the area that's swept out as you go from theta equals alpha to theta equals beta. So got to make sure you understand it's always about these areas of these wedges. So let's go ahead and summarize this and then take a look at an example. So again, suppose you have a polar curve where you treat r as a function of theta. Then you can calculate the area inside this curve swept out from theta equals alpha to theta equals beta by the area being equal to the integral from alpha to beta, one half r squared d theta. And again, just to really reinforce that, remember visually what this is doing is if that is your first angle and that is your second angle, and you have some curve that connects those, right? 
then if this is theta equals alpha and this is theta equals beta, this area that is being described right here measures this area of the wedge there. Okay, so now that we understand that measuring areas in polar coordinates is still done via a definite integral, even though it's a slightly different area that we're trying to understand here, let's go ahead and take a look at an example. So we're going to consider this polar curve, r equals 6 cosine 3 theta, and we're going to try to sketch a graph of this and then determine the area inside of this. So what do we know about this? Well, we know that this is going to be one of those petal graphs. And since we have a 3 in here, which is odd, it should have 3 petals. So once again, we already sort of know generally what this should look like. We're expecting three petals for this petal graph, but uh, we probably still want some uh, values just to make drawing it a little bit easier. So once again, you can probably get away by just doing sort of a fourth of the period. Do be careful though here because the period has been modified. Normally it's two pi. Since we have three theta in there, the period is actually going to be two pi divided by three which means that if we want to use a quarter of that, a quarter of 2 pi over 3, looks like we should actually get something like pi over 6. So we should probably go by pi over 6 to make our table of values. So we'll have our theta, 0, pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6, pi, 7 pi over 6, uh, 4 pi over 3, 3 pi over 2, uh, what else do we have there then, 5 pi over 3, 11 pi over 6, and 2 pi. All right, and we have r equals 6 cosine 3 theta. So let's plug these in at 0. In here, you're going to have a cosine of 0, which is 6. At pi over 6, well, pi over 6 times 3 is going to be pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we get 0. At pi over 3, the argument is actually going to be pi, which makes cosine negative 1, so we get negative 6. Then at pi over 2, we're going to get 3 pi over 2 as the argument, which has a cosine of 0. And at 2 pi over 3, when we plug that in, uh, 3 times 2 pi over 3 is going to be 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is 1, so we get 6. Now we can probably guess the sort of pattern here. You can check these if you want on your own, but you should get zero here, then negative six, then zero, and six, zero, negative six, zero, and six. You can check that every time we're doing this, we're either getting six, zero, or negative six. This happens pretty commonly when you use that trick of only going by a quarter of the period. Uh, well, if you think about that sort of visually, if you have a wave function, if a quarter of the period means that you're either hitting the sort of peak midline valley every time. So you're just getting all those sort of most important values. So let's go ahead and draw this. Uh, it looks like we can just go one, two, three, four, five, six. So our first point uh, right there. Then at pi over 6, we need to be back at the origin. So we'll have a point here. So again, might be a good idea to draw that in. Remember, you've got to draw this back to there before that angle pi over 6. So you don't want to do it something like that because we, need, we know it makes it back right at pi over 6. So we'll draw that in. Something that looks like that, perfect. All right, now at pi over three, which should be facing this way, we get negative six. So we're actually going to back up down here and end up at negative six, which is right there. So we should be right there instead. Then at pi over two, uh, which should be this way, we're back at the origin. So we're gonna be right here. And of course that happens by the time we're at pi over two. Since we're sort of in the negatives here, we're back over here. So we got to make sure that this thing makes it in before that line there. So we can sort of see our visualization there. We're going to draw this thing out to here. It hits its maximum radius there. And then we got to make it back in before that pi over 2, 3 pi over 2 line, that y-axis. There we go. So you can already see one of the leaves. Probably another one is going to be over here, and it looks like another one should be over there. But we can go ahead and keep using our table of values. So we just got back to 0. Now we're at 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3 is this way. 
Uh, we do have a positive radius, so we actually do end up over there. So we end up all the way out there. And then uh, if we look right after 2 pi over 3 at 5 pi over 6, which is right here, we need to make it back to the origin. So this thing comes looping through here, and then we make it back in before that 5 pi over 6. So we can draw this thing in here. There we go. And then have it scoot back in. There we go. All right. Now at pi, which means we should be facing this way, well, uh, it's going to actually be out here. So we're actually going to swing down through here and connect back over to there. Might as well just go ahead and draw that in immediately. So there we go. And now something sort of interesting happens. At 7 pi over 6, which is over here, we should be back at 0. So if you think about it, you're right here, and you need to get back in before that sort of line there. All you're going to do is retrace this. Now, I could go ahead and plug in my other values, but remember, we know that this thing is supposed to be a pedal graph with three pedals, and we've gotten our three pedals there. So I don't think there's anything more to sort of be done. We actually know that this section is just going to actually have a swing through our curve another time. So actually, if you go ahead and do that, you're going to get all parts of that, those pedals repeated again, which means we really don't need to worry about trying to graph those. It doesn't add anything to our graph. It's just repeating the same curve again. So there we go. There's our pedal graph based on sort of a table of values, but a little bit of extra information just because we already know ahead of time what it's supposed to look like. All right, now we'd like to determine the area inside this polar curve. As always, uh, with polar curves, as we're going to see, we want to try to make use of symmetry. So if we think about this, the easiest way to sort of do this is to think about this as we start here and we work our way back. So in other words, we're going to sort of take the area inside half of one petal. And if we do that, it should be pretty clear. If we sort of trace out, we'll actually trace it out. The area that we're going to try to do, we're going to try to do this area here. Now, if I think about where this leaf starts at well it starts at angle zero and then it makes it back to the origin when did that happen well it's when the radius was zero we could plug in and just do zero equals six cosine three theta and solve that but remember we also have it on our table of values right here pi over six and zero so we know that it ends at pi over six so that means that that red area there is going to be the integral from zero to pi over six those are the bounds for our angle one half, and then the radius function squared, which is six cosine three theta. So six cosine three theta squared d theta. So this expression here will give us this area right in there. Now, of course, that is one half of one leaf. So the actual area here, if we were just interested in setting this up, is going to be six times the integral from zero to pi over six, one half six cosine three theta squared d theta. So there we go. That's the expression for the area inside the entire curve. So inside all three of those leaves. Now you might say, well, is the symmetry really important? Can't we just integrate zero to two pi? Well, actually this is a great example where if you integrated from zero to two pi, like we said, zero to two pi actually causes you to trace this thing out more than once, which means if you integrate from 0 to 2 pi, you're going to get an area that actually overcounts the overall area. So with polar curves, because of the fact that we remember you have non-uniqueness of representation of points, and sometimes the curves trace back over themselves, you always want to choose the simplest symmetric piece, which in this case it was from angle 0 to angle pi over 6, giving us one half of one leaf. So we had six times that to get the overall area. Now, this one, just for a little practice, we are going to go ahead and calculate it. Nothing fancy in calculating it. Once you go to actually calculate, it's just going to be a normal integral. But let's go ahead and do it just to get a little practice back on integration. So uh, before we go on to a new page, let's grab this because this is going to be what we're going to try to evaluate here. Let's see real quick. Okay. And we'll go on to the next one here.
All right, so that's what we need to try to do. Let's go ahead and simplify that a bit. Uh, looks like we should get that the area is 3 times the integral 0 to pi over 6, 36 cosine squared 3 theta d theta. Then, of course, we could thring, swing that 36 out there. And if we do that, we get that the area uh, is, what, 108, integral 0 to pi over 6, cosine squared 3 theta d theta. Now we have to remember how to integrate a cosine squared. Remember, powers of sine and cosine, we hope for odd powers, so we can save one, convert the rest, and use u substitution. Unfortunately, this is an even power, so we need to use a double angle identity. So we would do this as 108 integral 0 to pi over 6, 1 half plus 1 half cosine, 2 times this argument, which would give us 6 theta d theta in there. Okay, now we can go ahead and integrate. So we have 108, we get 1 half theta, and then when we integrate this, Integral of cosine is sine, but since we have a 6 theta, that is a linear substitution. You could, of course, do u equals 6 theta, du is 6 d theta, 1 6. We're going to get an extra factor of 1 6 there. So 1 12 sine 6 theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 6. All right, let's go ahead and plug this stuff in then. So we get that the area is 108 times... We plug in the pi over 6, looks like we should get pi over 12, plus plug in the pi over 6 in here. That means the argument is going to be pi. Sine of pi is 0, so we get plus 0. And then minus, what happens when we plug in the 0? Zero? 0 here, sine of 0 also 0, so minus 0. So there we go. Looks like we get uh, 108 times pi over 12. So it looks like the area here is going to be 9 pi. And remember, this area is not just the area of that one half of the one leaf. It is 9 pi for the entire inside of this graph. So all of this, all of this in here, and all of this in here. So there we go. That's our first example of setting up the area inside a polar curve, as well as actually calculating it, just remembering a little trick with that double angle identity. All right, we've got one last geometric quantity that we can understand via calculus for, par for polar curves here, which is arc length. So let's talk about that and get to our last example for this video. So if we go ahead and we talk about arc lengths for polar curves, so big question is how to determine arc lengths of polar curves. So once again, let's give ourselves a little visualization. So let's imagine we have a polar curve, and maybe it starts here and moves to there. So this is theta equals alpha, this is theta equals beta, and what we want to sort of calculate is the distance along this curve from this point to this point. So as we sort of go like that, how far of a distance is that along that path? Well, once again, the trick is going to rely on treating this like a parametric. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat this like a parametric curve with parameter theta. So remember for arc length, where well you guys have learned a lot of arc length formulas, you have integral like a to b square root one plus dy dx squared dx. That's the one that lets you work dx. Uh, we also had integral like c to d square root one plus dx dy squared dy. That's the one that lets you work dy. But we also came up with one for parametrics. So let's use that, treating the parameter as theta. So that would be the integral from that alpha to beta, square root. Normally in the parametric, it's dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. But of course, we're using the parameter theta. So we'll get dx d theta squared plus dy d theta squared d theta. But how can we express dx d theta and dy d theta? Well, again, use those conversions, right? r equals, sorry, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. Let's differentiate those with respect to theta, again, treating r as a function of theta, so we you need product rule. So dx d theta will be dr d theta cosine theta, 
minus r sine theta, and dy d theta will be dr d theta sine theta plus r cosine theta. We actually already did these back when we were doing the derivative in polar coordinates. So let's plug these in. So we now have that the arc length is the integral from alpha to beta square root. For dx d theta, we're going to replace it with this. So we have dr d theta cosine theta minus r sine theta all squared plus dr d theta sine theta plus r cosine theta squared and that square root d theta. Now we could just leave it like this, but this is pretty messy. I mean, we've got these expressions all squared out. We're going to make it a bit worse by actually expanding these, but we'll see that if we expand these squares out, things can actually simplify. So let's go ahead and do that. So integral alpha to beta, we'll have a giant square root here. Let's expand this thing, so we'll foil this out. So it looks like we'll get dr d theta cosine theta squared. Then we'll get a cross term, which looks like it's going to be minus 2 dr d theta cosine theta r sine theta. And then we'll multiply this with itself, which means we're going to get plus r sine theta squared. So all of this is the expansion of this. Now I need to expand this as well. So I'll just put this underneath, even though it'll look a little weird. If we do that, we get dr d theta sine of theta squared. The cross term here is going to be positive. So it's going to be 2 dr d theta sine theta r cosine theta plus r cosine theta squared and then we have a d theta. Now this looks absolutely horrendous, but notice that this whole term cancels with this whole term. So if we go to rewrite this, so let's grab all of this. Okay. So if we grab all of that, like we said, first thing we can sort of do is just go ahead and cancel these out. So we now have that the arc length is the integral from alpha to beta square root. Looks like we have dr d theta squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta plus dr d theta squared sine squared theta plus r squared cosine squared theta d theta. Now this is still pretty messy, but it simplifies even further. Imagine adding this and this. If you do that, you'd get dr d theta squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. But what's cosine squared plus sine squared? It's just one. So putting these two together just gives us this. So we get the integral from alpha to beta square root dr d theta squared. Can we do a similar trick with these two? Well, for sure, if you add those, if you add this guy and this guy, you're going to get r squared times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. Once again, this is 1, so we're just going to get r squared. So after all of that work, we get that the arc length in polar coordinates has a very nice simple formula. It's just the integral from alpha to beta square root dr d theta squared plus r squared. Now, one thing that's very important to recognize here is that this derivative in here, this is not dy dx in here. This is dr d theta, which means you take r as a function of theta, and just differentiate it with respect to theta. So this is the derivative of r with respect to theta. So nice, simple arc length formula, despite all the messiness along the way. So let's summarize this and get to our last example. So for the summary here, suppose you have a polar curve, then you can calculate the arc length along this curve from alpha to beta, angle alpha to angle beta, by the integral from alpha to beta, square root r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta. So this gives us an expression for the arc length when we're working in polar coordinates. All right, let's give this a try with one last example here. 
So we're going to consider the polar curve r equals 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta. We're going to try to sketch a graph of this polar curve, and then we're going to write down but do not evaluate an expression for the arc length of the inner loop of this curve, and then we're going to write down but do not evaluate an expression for the area inside the inner loop of this curve. So this sort of gives it away already that it has an inner loop. Why is that? Well, root 3 is roughly about 1.7. 2 root 3 is roughly then about 3.4. That means this 3.4 is larger than this 3, so negative radii are possible, meaning this limason here is going to have an inner loop. So we already know that this is a limason inner loop, and it's going to be horizontal, or it's going to have horizontal symmetry because it's based around cosine. So we know it's going to have an inner loop. It's going to have horizontal symmetry. Well, let's go ahead and just get a few values, and then we should be able to graph it very easily. So let's go ahead and get our theta, and r equals, we said 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta. Period is still 2 pi, so a quarter of that is pi over 2. So we'll just do 0 pi over 2 uh, pi. 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Let's plug those in. At 0, we're going to get 3 plus 2 root 3. We said root 3 is about 1.7. 2 root 3 is about 3.4. 3 plus 3.4. This is going to be roughly about 6.4. At pi over 2, we're going to get 3. At pi, we're going to get 3 minus 2 root 3, which is going to be roughly negative 0.4. That's where that negative radius is going to come from. 3 pi over 2, we're going to be at 3. 2 pi, we're going to be back at 3 plus 2 root 3, which is approximately 6.4. Now, there is one other thing we should do here. Notice that the arc length and the area talk about the inner loop. We already know that this has an inner loop. It is not a bad idea when working with a limason that has an inner loop to also figure out where that inner loop starts and ends. So let's go ahead and do that down here. So how to find beginning slash end of inner loop. Well, remember the inner loop is caused by those negative radii. So it's where you go from positive radii to negative radii back to positive. Well, since everything's continuous, that means you're going from positive numbers to negative numbers back to positive. That means the beginning and the end of the inner loop occur when you go through that origin or when you have radius zero. So what we do is we set r equal to zero and we solve. So we would get 0 equals 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta. If we solve that, it looks like we get minus 3 is 2 root 3 cosine theta. If you divide this over, 3 divided by root 3 is going to be root 3. So we get negative root 3 over 2 equals cosine theta. Where is cosine theta equal to negative root 3 over 2? Well, this gives us angles like 5 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. Technically, it gives us 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k and 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, but we know when working with these polar ones, we just need the ones that happen between 0 and 2 pi, so there's going to be two solutions there. How do I know these two? Well, that's just unit circle stuff. Make sure you're comfortable identifying your unit circle values at like 1 half, root 2 over 2, negative root 3 over 2, positive, negative, all that sort of stuff. So this is just from unit circle knowledge of cosine theta. These are the two angles that give us negative root 3 over 2. So we also know that these are the moments where the radius is 0. So let's go ahead and use that to start drawing this in. Our first angle at 0 gives us a radius of 6.4. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6.4 is going to be somewhere like there. There we go. Then at pi over 2, facing this way, we're going to be 1, 2, 3. So we'll be up here. Okay. Then our next one would be pi, which is at negative 0.4. But remember, we know we actually hit the origin. So let's go ahead and put that in. And I would go ahead and draw this now. So I'm drawing from here to here. And then I need to make it into there by that 5 pi over 6. So if we do that, we can sort of draw that in. And then we got to make it in before that 5 pi over 6. OK, there we go. Then we had pi, we're at negative 0.4. So negative 0.4 is going to be like right there. So I'm a little unhappy with how that looks. Let's just 
Let's just redraw that real quick. Okay, there we go. Now we know it swings underneath, hits there, and then it's going to come back around. And remember, it's got to make it back by 7 pi over 6, so it makes it back by this line there. So we have this thing. We can zoom in to maybe make this a little bit nicer looking. So we have our curve coming in, swings underneath, and then makes it back in before that 7 pi over 6 pi over 6 line. So there's our inner loop, swings in like that. And then back out, we know at 3 pi over 2, it's going to be down at 3, 1, 2, 3. So we're going to have a point there. So now, there we go. And then we extend all the way back out to there. So there we go. And you'll notice that we did sort of a careful job of as this guy swung in here, he made it in before this 5 pi over 6. Then we sort of traced down here, came back around, and then made it back to the origin by that 7 pi over 6, and then continued on. So there we go. So that gives us our picture of our limason with that inner loop. The inner loop starts at 5 pi over 6 and ends at 7 pi over 6. Now that we also have those, that'll make it a bit easier to go ahead and get an expression for the area and arc length of that inner loop. So let's go ahead and do that on the next page. So if we want to uh, look at B, remember we have R is uh, 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta. Oh, notice also in our picture here that it does have that horizontal symmetry, right, which we expected because it's based on cosine. Uh, so we have our r equals 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta. If we'd like to get the arc length of that inner loop, well, we now know that the inner loop uh, starts at 5 pi over 6 and goes to 7 pi over 6. Then we need to do square root. Uh, we need to get that dr d theta. So dr d theta, differentiating this with respect to theta, that'll be gone. Derivative of cosine is negative. So we get negative 2 root 3 sine theta. So we'll throw that stuff in there. We said that this comes out as r squared plus dr d theta squared. So our r is this. So we get 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta all squared plus dr d theta, which is negative 2 root 3 sine theta. Square that as well. Close up that radical and then d theta. Would there be a way to do this with symmetry? Well, if we look, that was giving us the arc length. So what we just did is we calculated starting from here, following it all the way around to there. We could, of course, also go from here to here, sort of taking that underneath piece. So if we wanted to, we could do, or we could do the integral from 5 pi over 6 to sort of the tip of that inner loop which we know occurs at angle pi, which has that sort of minimum radius there. So we could also say that this is 2 times the integral from 5 pi over 6 to pi, and then, of course, the exact same expression in here. So I'm not going to rewrite it. We'll just take this. There we go. Could you use a different sort of symmetry? Sure, you could do pi to 7 pi over 6 as well and double that either way. So there we go. Now we've, we've come up with expressions for the arc length of that inner loop. Uh, would I recommend trying to evaluate these? Now, these are pretty messy to do. As you can see, they're going to have a bunch of powers of trigonometric functions under the radical. Not going to go through and deal with actually trying to evaluate those here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the same for the area. So for the area, well, once again, you could choose if you want to do this or sort of use the symmetry. So you could say the area is going to be from 5 pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6. And then remember, you'd have 1 half times the radius function, 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta, all that squared, d theta. Or well, if you prefer to use the symmetry, which is always a good habit to get, integral 5 pi over 6 to pi, double that, 1 half, 3 plus 2 root 3 cosine theta squared d theta.
So both of these arc length and area, they're not calculating the overall arc length or area. They're just calculating the arc length around that little inner loop. So from here all the way to there. And the second, the area is actually calculating everything inside of that. All right. So now we've seen how to calculate derivatives, areas, and arc lengths when we're in polar coordinates. In our next video, which will be our very last video for 10.4 and for our course overall, we'll just take a look at a couple more examples, specifically getting some more practice with areas and talking a little bit about how to do areas between two polar curves.